Welcome to the Listen Up Podcast, where we explore hearing loss, communication, connections, and health. Hi, everybody. Dr. Mark Sims here. I'm the host of the Listen Up Podcast. I feature top leaders in healthcare. This episode is brought to you by Arizona Hearing Center. At Arizona Hearing Center, I help people to effectively treat their hearing loss, remain independent, and connected with their loved ones. The reason I'm so passionate about hearing loss is I lost my brother Robbie twice. First, from hearing loss from hearing loss from radiation to his brain tumor, and then again later from complications from that tumor. I am an ear, nose, and throat doctor who only takes care of ears on the E of ENT. I've taken care of tens of thousands, over 10,000 people with surgical interventions and tens of thousands of people with hearing loss. I'm passionate about getting them to hear better. I've written a book called Listen Up, A Physician's Guide to Hearing Loss. You can see that book or learn more about it at www.listenuphearing.com. And you can learn more about my practice at www.azhear.com. Today, I'm really excited. I have a great guest. It's uh, Dig Howitt. He is the CEO of Cochlear Corporation. He got his MBA from Stanford, and he did an engineering group degree at University of Sydney. He was uh, became the president and CEO of Cochlear in 2008. He's been in that position since, and the business has been doing great. We're here to talk to him about hearing loss and cochlear implants. Dig, thanks for coming on the episode. Mark, it's terrific to be here and join you today. Uh, thanks. So he's, he's coming in from Sydney. They're in lockdown right now, unfortunately, from COVID. Hopefully it clears. And by the time you're watching this episode, that's all good. Dig, I got to ask you, I, I told you this question I was going to ask you. Tell me about the name Dig. I mean, I, I actually Googled it. I don't think it's a common uh, name like in the common dictionary. So what's the origin of your name, Dig? No. no Great name, by the way. I love that name. Thank you. Thank you. No, it's not a common name at all. It's actually short for Diggery, uh, which is D-I-G-G-O-R-Y. Oh, okay. um, naturally gets shortened to Greg as Gregory gets to, to Greg. Uh, and the origin of Diggory is un- uncertain. Uh, my parents found it in a name book as they were before I was born, searching for a name to for me. And um, it, it's there's two potential origins of it. One is um, Old English, um, after a, a, supposedly after a medieval hero. The other one is Old French, uh, from a word that means straight or lost. So we've got two quite different alternatives. Well, hopefully it's uh, great more than lost, Dave. <laughs> yeah, Whichever word. Right. It's a great name. I mean, it's, uh, so it's it's funny, right? Because the answer is they saw it in a name book and they liked it, is what you're telling me, which is a, just that's as good it. a reason as anything, right? If you're yep. going to call your child it, you better like the name. So that's a great story. So, you know, I, I know you're in the hearing loss space. You've been in it for over 20 years. It's a great space to be in. Tell me how you went from engineering. Uh, you told me you started at uh, Boston Consulting Group, and then uh, I know you got an MBA at Stanford. How did you end up in the hearing space? Yeah, it's, it's uh, certainly wasn't ever a planned journey, but it's worked out remarkably well. So I did do electrical engineering, and I, and I always was interested in business, and I liked engineering and products. So uh, when I left university, I really didn't then want to go and be an engineer. The engineering jobs in Australia at that time uh, weren't particularly attractive, the ones I could see. Okay. Uh, so I went I went to Boston Consulting Group to learn more about business, and I, I didn't really know anything about business, but I thought it sounded interesting. Uh, and um, so I, did, I went to BCG. I did that for about four years, and I did find it really interesting. I learned a lot. I worked across a whole range of business. industries as a junior analyst. Uh, and then saw the opportunity to do an MBA. And uh, so I did that. I went to Stanford. And so I was at Stanford in the mid 90s, which was just a fantastic time to be in Silicon Valley. As the dot com uh, was going crazy right then, right? It was. It was right at the, the Netscape IPO happened. Uh, Yahoo was, um, there's a couple of guys on campus who were doing this interesting thing with the, with internet search. Uh, it was pre Google and Amazon. Right. Um, but a fascinating time to do an MBA. Uh, yeah, in the middle of Silicon Valley, the start of the tech boom. So with all that going on around me, when I got to the end of the MBA, I chose to take a job in construction materials, so cement and concrete and quarries. And I look back now and think, well, which bit of the tech boom did I not see? Um, yeah, fair enough, right? <laughs> so I went into a very old industry. But I think the, the reason for doing it is I didn't want to get into business. I wanted to get into business management. Again, I had a thought that maybe that would suit me. And I like products. I, like, I wanted to be a company that made something. So I, I did that for um, four years. I ended up running a, a cement company. 
which I, and I learned enormous about, about leading a business and the challenges of it. Business is a really tough business. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, so but it was a great experience. Image, that's really hard, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so toughened me up, which was good. And, and but also then thought this now by 2000, the tech boom was in full swing. And I thought I need to do something higher tech. I got 30 plus years of, uh, in front of me and I like technology. Let's go looking. And the great thing about coming out of the cement and concrete industry looking for higher tech is just about any industry, other industry qualifies um, with no disrespect to people with cement and concrete. Um, and, and a job with Cochlear came up in, in R&D, uh, managing engineers. And uh, Cochlear was quite a, a much smaller company at that stage. Um, even in Australia, it wasn't particularly well known. Um, but I went along to the interview and uh, liked the people. Uh, Jim Patrick was one of the people who interviewed me back yep. then uh, and just thought this technology is fascinating. So I, I got the job uh, working in R&D. Uh, I did that for about 12 months. Then an opportunity came up uh, to run manufacturing. So I moved from, I said, look, if you've been in a cement company, you can you know, how right, know something right. on manufacturing. Right. Moved into manufacturing and, and I ran Cockpit Manufacturing um, for just over 12 years of manufacturing in the global supply chain. It's important. Uh, you need to make it. You need to get it places. So those are yep. important things. That's for sure. It, it is. And a great opportunity to get really close to the technology. So all of the new product development, all the R&D work. Uh, then I moved into uh, lead our Asia Pacific business uh, for, for a few years. And that's just an amazingly diverse business with uh, Country from Australia to India to Japan to China, all four different very, ways very it's different. delivered, right? Cochlear oh yeah, delivered, all sorts of different ways. Yeah, yeah, some similarities, but also some real diversity in how those uh, countries work and the needs of hear- the hearing are the same, but how the delivery, as you said, happens is quite different. Um, and from there, I went uh, to be chief operating officer and then uh, CEO about three and a half years ago. So uh, you know, when I when I came to Cochlear, I thought, oh, look, I'll, I'll do this for a few years. It'll be interesting and I'll move on. Else, right? Yeah, but it was just just a, a couple of things. Just the, the impact that this technology has on people's lives is uh, unbelievable. Uh, and, and I look around, I cannot see a business that I would rather work in because of that impact. And it's just fascinating technology and fascinating global challenges too. So I, I'm 21 years on, I am still learning. And every day see how much more I still have to learn. And while yeah, I'm doing I, that, I think many it. of your employees uh, will stay because of the mission, right? And yeah. So there are people who kind of get into the hearing world uh, vortex and never get out because they love what the company, you know, not, I mean, not just what Cochlear does, but the whole yeah. thing. So obviously I come from a different direction, but I think it's an awesome place to be in terms of taking care of patients and stuff. So, well, that's great. And so, you know, as the CEO, like what's the best part of your day? The, the best bit of my day is, uh, is, Talking, talking to, to people who uh, believe in the mission, uh, uh, and whether that's uh, people like you, Mark, who are helping de- delivering the therapy, whether that's our recipients who've ha- whose life has changed, um, whether it's a, you know parents of a child born with hearing loss to an older person who could hear for many many years and then lost their hearing, or to our employees who are just um, so engaged in our mission. That that's by far the most fun bit of my day is when I get a chance to um, interact, with people. interact with people and talk with them and hear their stories. And How many employees does Cochlear have now? I, I uh, over 4,000 people wow. uh, in from 40, more than 40 countries around the world now. That's a big uh, team. It's a big team, yeah. yeah. It's, it's been growing, which is great. It's not part of being successful is to be able so, to grow. So when you started, how many employees were there? Uh, uh, about 600 when I started. There's a company is uh, about... Ten times as big in terms of the number of implants and uh, revenue. Now about uh, what's that? About eight times, seven times as big in terms of the number of employees. Well, hopefully, uh, amazing they, changes. I mean, I'm not an expert at business, but hopefully, the revenue grows faster than the number of employees. It has done over that period. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm not sure you're you're going in the right direction. But I'll, I'll just leave it at that. So, so, so you know, you've seen a lot of advances. So over the time you've been in the hearing space, like what would you say are the biggest advances you've seen in, in cochlear implants over the 20 years you i mean i i'll tell you uh you know i did my residency and right when i was doing my otology fellowship was right when 
cochlear implants were going to BTE. I mean, the first behind the ear. Pro- yeah. So, I mean, I think a lot of people go, really? Like it wasn't behind the ear the whole time. No, there were body processors. And so I know that that was a huge one, but, but what are the other advances that you've seen? I mean, certainly getting ear level technology is amazing. Yeah. That, and that happened just as I, uh, just before I joined and, um, yeah, amazing move there. Look, I, I think, I think uh, a few things that, uh, uh, stand out. One is uh, the connectivity that, that has happened in in sort of the last five years. Uh, but now, cell phones I think about, to your CI to your TV. Yeah, so the ability to stream music, phone calls straight through to the the processor and the implant, uh, and I think amazing just for the flexibility and the convenience that that gives. Sure. But it's the it's the opportunity to the future of this connected technology, which I think um, is really exciting. You know, it, all of this connectivity enables care, the chronic phase of care to be delivered at home over time and for people to be getting you know, up-to-date data on how they're performing, if there's any checkups that they need. Right. So the power of the connectivity, which first comes through just streaming a telephone call or a podcast, the ability to use that. In the you mean upstream example. rather than downstream connectivity? Yeah. Right. So yeah. rather yeah. than coming to the implant, of going from the implant to something. Yes. Yeah. That's so that, I think that's one. Look, I think the the other one, which I think is a, is really important, but is still emerging, um, is the understanding of the sort of electroneural interface, uh, and so I think with the with the a slim body or electrode, electrode position very close to that neural interface, we're learning a lot more uh, about the interface, the power of getting that right, the power of the right position. Yeah, uh, it, it's fascinating in my time how that was actually in the vernacular of cochlear implants 20 years ago. And then unfortunately, some of the issues with meningitis were upon us. And that, yes. all, that all kind of got put on the back. It's amazing that it got put on the back burner. It set it back 15 years. You know, because it, it was a big topic because yep. it also has to do with battery consumption too, right? The distance from the, uh, yeah. like, the, the yeah. never determined battery consumption. Yeah. And, and I think getting, yes. Yeah. I think it, it's taken a while and getting the design right, getting the, the technology to actually understand that positioning. But I, I think that's very exciting in terms of, we're starting to see some of that now in terms of some of the results. Uh, yeah. Terms, yeah there's I, a lot I, more to come. The hard part is obviously, uh, by the time you get the results, you've already moved the field post, right? So you've got results on a prior generation implant. Yeah. You guys have already innovated and uh, offered a new processor or a new implant or electrode or something like that. Yeah, it's one of the, the uh, I think features of this therapy is that the cycle times are pretty long. Just as you said, you do something and then you study it for a number of years and then several people and you learn a lot and then you move further again so you've sort of got to anticipate uh, what do you think we're going to see and move in yeah, anticipation I, in my medical career i liken it to um premature babies right like so you really don't know the outcome of a premature mm. baby let's say till they're cognitively and physiologically mature at 20 and by the time that happens you're prognosticating on 20 year old intervention so you really yeah. never yes. know what the outcome is you can tell what the bottom is but the top is not set right because things keep on changing yeah it's a bit. It's actually a bit like bringing up children. Is you, you, you do the best job you can, but it's actually not for twenty. You don't get feedback for twenty years. Yeah, if then, if you're lucky, right? Yeah. <laughs> so you know, I, I, you know, we, you and I both know there are a lot of challenges in the cochlear implant space. So if you could make one go away or one challenge change, what what, what would that be? Like you know, what, yeah. what would be the, the single thing I'd love to change is that there are hundreds of thousands of people getting hearing aids that would get but would. Get a much better hearing outcome if they got a cochlear implant. I think that access for people with um, this is postlingual people with a severe to profound loss to cochlear implant is a huge opportunity to really improve the lives of hundreds of thousands. Yeah, I think the whole hearing continuum is an issue, right? In other words, yeah. you guys are perhaps further down on the continuum of, mm. of, of loss, but even at the upper level. I mean, uh, one of the people I talked to uh, is doing a lot of research on uh, mild hearing loss or, you know, even a 
15 to 20 dB hearing loss, which is considered normal. And the functional measurements of impairment that they are measurements of impairment they have there. So even what we consider normal actually isn't normal. Yeah, interesting. So, interesting. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. So I suppose if I could restate that, what would I change is that, that hearing loss was actually treated like as a serious disease state. Yeah. Well, I think it's coming. I mean, but it's, uh, you know, that's actually one of the missions of the podcast is try to get that word out. Mm. So, you know, speaking of like, what do you see as the things that can be done to increase awareness and access to the uh, cochlear implantation or hearing technology in general? Because you guys are part of a whole ecosystem of treatments, right? And so yeah. if people don't get the other treatments, they're not going to get yours, likely. Right? Yep. Yeah. No, that, that that's right. Look, I, I, think, I think several things. I think, yeah, the, uh, awareness is clearly one of the big, big issues. And awareness comes in many forms. Um, people typically don't have awareness of the, the level of hearing loss that they've got. Yeah, I do. Um, if they do have awareness of the hearing loss, they often typically don't regard it as a significant problem. Yeah. It's just something that happens when you age. You know, your hair goes grey or your hair falls out, your hearing deteriorates. Part of the aging process. Get on with life, you know. Uh, but so I think working to show that hearing loss actually has flow on um, problems. You know, that that hearing, healthy hearing is a really important part of healthy aging. And yeah. there's a lot of research going into it. So I think that's a really important part of getting, raising the profile of, of hearing loss over time. That it's, this is actually treatable. And yeah, it's interesting. Better. Uh, I, you know, I really have struggled uh, how to communicate that with patients. Mm. So, so the analogy I use is, is it's like if you had lost a leg, right? And so you're an amputee. So one of your options is to hop up and down on one foot, right? And if you saw, yeah. if somebody saw somebody going down the sidewalk, hopping up and down on one foot, they'd say, that's crazy. Go get an artificial leg at least, right? And so yeah. people who haven't treated their hearing loss are doing the equivalent of hopping up and down on one foot. Because they have an yeah. un, unrehabilitated deficit, and so yep. and so people have to look at it as a deficit, not just a normal process of, of aging. Yeah, that's right, and it's and that's a good analogy too, because you know it's you're a disability down on one foot, your disability, and you're actually your other leg is working really hard. Correct. You're using a lot more. You got to concentrate harder right. on how you get around. And that's the same with hearing loss. You got to right. concentrate much harder to hear. So more of your brain energy is getting absorbed in trying to hear versus to other things, so people are tired of there. Now, I think that I think we'll see over time, and, and that's a hypothesis, obviously. But the links between cognition and hearing loss—they're pretty clear. I suspect right? they're pretty clear, and I suspect they're quite causal. And, and there's some studies going on to show that. Well, it's fascinating, uh, though. But, like you know, when you look at medicine, so you know, medicine started treating high blood pressure in the 1950s. We did not have the definitive studies to show that. Treating high blood pressure decreased cardiac morbidity and mortality till the 70s. But we did it. So it's kind yeah. of interesting that people say, well, there's mm -hmm. not enough evidence. Well, we have enough anecdotal evidence, and there's very little downside to treating hearing loss. So it's kind of interesting to me that some people say, we need more studies. I don't think we actually need more studies. We all know from clinical practice that this is yeah. the deal. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and as you said, it's just then sensible insurance. Yeah. You have to. But so, well, let's wait for the evidence in 20 years, go 20, 20 years of hearing loss while you wait for the evidence. And well, but I think the real answer is, is go to the public, right? I mean, if they value yeah. it, then, then it'll happen. I mean, you know, it's interesting. I was talking to a guy who's an Alzheimer's expert and he called, he said, we're finding that sensory deprivation is, um, causing Alzheimer's. Well, maybe it is sensory deprivation, but maybe it's cognitive overload, right? And so, yeah. you know, yes. the, the, he's describing the, the measurable deficit, but that might not be the brain problem. The brain problem might be cognitive overload that you're working so yep. hard to do. Right? Yeah. So, so I think you know, too, if we can, uh, you know, we've got to get public, uh, increase public awareness of, of hearing loss or the consequences of not treating it. Uh, and then I think in the, in what I call the, the delivery in the professional care, uh, I think we've got to educate there too. Uh, and that's particularly in the, in the hearing aid channel. Uh, that you know, cochlear implants are not routinely considered in the hearing aid channel for people sure. with severe to profound loss. Uh, and I think we're that's we've awareness. Got to do though. I think that's education of our peers. Uh, yeah, and, and and I think part backed by the evidence too. There, I think. Yeah, yeah I, yeah. I think interestingly, one of the other things I'll say is, is you know, so there's my dog. I <laughs> I, I, I hope somebody's not breaking him, but 
anyway, I wrote, um, you know, I wrote this book and people ask me all the time, is, is the book for patients or peers? And my answer is both. Right. Yeah. The reason is, is because I, I think, you know, my peers need to learn more about hearing loss as well. And so, you know, there is an overall awareness problem. I mean, I think yeah. there are tons of peers of mine who are talking to patients who are remarkably hearing impaired and they don't even realize. It. So. Yes. Yeah. It was, I mean, that's just an interesting one on the general practice practitioners uh, of that. We know that one in three people over 65 will have a disabling hearing loss, but very few first line um, doctors will, will actually check that the person sitting opposite them can hear them. Right. They do well. They come. It really speaks to that cognitive correction, right? Speech reading, yeah. contextual ability to compensate. And that's why I say to people there's a difference between hearing and communicating. So. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, tell me about, you know, you've traveled in Pacific and Asia, mm. so those are different delivery markets. What what are some of the challenges facing them that we don't see, for instance, in the United States? Like, so it must be a totally different or ways they approach delivering. So what are the challenges in that context? Yeah, so, so uh, some, some, at some level, the challenge is the same. Awareness is an issue absolutely everywhere. Uh, in other countries, though, and certainly some of the, the emerging countries, just the availability of professional skill, yeah, uh, is, is definitely a, a constraint. Now we do a lot of work on surgical training to help build yeah, the course of surgical China, cohort. Of yeah, time. yeah. There we go. Thank it's you. But, yeah, no worries. It was fun. But, but we're doing that. They're, they're, they're fun, fun to do, and it's just so important. Um, but then also, there's not the audiology uh, infrastructure or the therapy for children, which is most of these emerging markets are about children, not adults, 95% of its children, uh, the therapy either. So there's a lot of work to do to build out the infrastructure and, and education in those. And, and in some countries, uh, audiology hasn't been seen as a profession until quite recently. Uh, so in you know, in some of these countries, they now have, do have university audiology courses, but if you go back 10 and 15 years, they didn't. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, uh, you know, not, not, again, I think hearing loss is really important, but I guess to some extent, you know, it's, it's a luxury relative to, you know, basic needs of, you know, housing, food, yep. those other struggles that occur in some of those environments. So. Yeah. And what we've seen over time is that's, that's changed that we've been, uh, in some of these countries since, uh, since the early 1990s. Yeah. Uh, and you certainly see as the wealth the economies right. grow, wealth develops, as healthcare system develops, uh, you know, infant mortality falls, then things like hearing loss in, in, start becoming in children start to become important. And particularly now, the growing importance of education for economic uh, wow. success yeah. and development is, is very well understood. And so what markets are growing fast? I mean, because that's actually an interesting, because that would yeah. reflect uh, market development. Mm. So, so China is growing Probably. very quickly and has for a long time. Uh, up until COVID-19, India was growing very strongly. It's, it's slowed up yeah, with all of the things we've read about India over the last 18 months. Uh, you know, Egypt is, is a country where there's an enormous, quite high birth rate, young population. Really growing, so it's uh, you know we've seen over the last twenty years just the growth across Asia Pacific uh, expansion through the Middle East uh, into Northern Africa. That's great. now now as well. So it's yeah, look, it's a really exciting time, and we've got now our um, our recipients in over one hundred and eighty countries That's around awesome. the world. Uh, yeah, really certainly. Awesome. Continues to change and grow and, and challenge us. Yeah, well, that's good because you have to deliver it everywhere. So, so you know, what I would tell you is, for the time I've been in cochlear implant field, they've always people have always talked about a total implantable cochlear, mm. right? And yeah. I know there have been some different attempts or different models and stuff. W where do you see that? I mean, it's what I mean. I will tell you, a large number of recipients say, "Hey, when's it going to be totally implantable?" Yeah, yeah. And I, you don't have to tell me why, but you know, I know there are certain challenges. Uh, and stuff, so. Yeah, look, I, I can, I can. I can certainly talk about it. So we have a, a feasibility study going on right now uh, with a totally implantable cochlear implant. I think out of that study, and we're still waiting the results, but I think what we'll see is that it's technologically possible to, to have a totally implantable cochlear implant. It's certainly complicated technology. Microphone. Uh, so, so the microphone, 
there's a couple of options for the microphone, but um, with what we've got at the moment is one that sits um, back just behind the ear, so un- under the skin behind the ear. Okay. So you want to try and get it as close to the, the ear as possible ear as we can, and away from your uh, hair, right? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, so we, you know, one of the, the important parts of this is pretty sophisticated noise cancelling to uh, eliminate not just noise of hair, but actually body noise. You know, the inside of your body is actually very noisy. Uh, oh, I never thought about that. Yeah, so just it's breathing, swallowing, pulse, right. uh, all of these things. So, so well, I think it, it's definitely technologically possible. Uh, I think we will definitely see a totally implantable one in the market. Now, we know in medical devices from technology possible to on the market it takes yeah. time. You've got to get the regulatory work done, and broader clinical studies, reimbursement work. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's a, you it's know, a still longer runway than tomorrow. Yeah, it's definitely a longer runway than tomorrow, but I, but I think, you know, it will, it will happen. Um, uh, and then we'll see how, you know, how the market accepts it. How the market accepts it. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, one of the big things I always tell patients is, uh, you know, probably that, biggest thing that's helped cochlear implants is cell phones, right? Because yeah. the battery technology, all yep. of the speaker technology, wireless transmission, all of that technology. I mean, cochlear implants are great and there's a lot of investment, but there's not enough uh, resources in the industry to develop itself. So getting that technology elsewhere is really helpful. Yeah, no, that's absolutely right. That our, our role in our R&D is to do some technology development, but very much to be a technology integrator. So, as you say, taking battery technology, uh, taking some of the material science from other industries, being able to put these things together uh, in a way that um, improves hearing, improves cochlear implants. It does amazing stuff, right? Yeah, it does. It does. It does. So, so tell me, like, uh, you know, where do you see cochlear implants, like, 5, 10, 25 years? Like, you know, you've been around it long mm. enough. Like, what's your crystal ball? I mean, it's as good as any, so. Yeah, yeah, look, it's always hard to predicted to the future. Like I, th- I think in five years, what we'll see is really the, the power of the connectivity uh, in our current system, so the ability to transfer data and sound back and forward from a smartphone to the, to the implant. Uh, I think we'll really start to see the value in that, both from the ability for the hearing care just to be much more convenient. Uh, sorry, hearing to be much more convenient. Right. The more seamless we make it, the better people do, the less they have to think about it, which is what they want. They just want to hear. Um, right. But then we're also able to start to provide, I think, some of the care uh, remotely, uh, be able to monitor the performance of the whole system and essentially how the person's hearing, be able to provide tips and advice on how to do better or to say, actually, you should come back into the clinic uh, because there's something that we should we should look at. So I think that could hopefully give people convenience, confidence, and advice on um, how they can do uh, even better. I think that's sort of the five year. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I guess my you know I look at it like parenting, right? The 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 technical side of parenting, where you're you know getting your kids to you know wash behind their ears and stuff. It, it's challenging, but the harder part is the psychosocial part, right? Getting them. To yeah. Better. And so that's where I see the challenge, right? Obviously, that connectivity doesn't take care of that part, but uh, the, yes. there'll be other, yeah, other yeah. tools that'll hopefully take care of that or work on that. So. Yeah, yeah. Now, and then I think if you look over 10 years, I think what we'll see there is that smarter implants come onto the market that enable, um, provide even more feedback on the hearing, potentially more personalized care. So do you mean the processor or the implant? Implant, implant. Huh? I, th- I think over the t- you know, over a ten year horizon, you'd see putting an implant that has um, sort of more processing power. You know, has the ability to um, sense more of um, what's going on from the hearing. So you mean like a resistance and things like that? Measuring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And look, even just being able to determine, um, you know, what we know that the sort of that the, the, the electrode neural interface is really important. It depends on the quality. One of the things depends on the quality of that neural interface. So it could give feedback interoperatively that you're getting a better <laughs> interface yep. or a closer interface. I, I think so, and it's and equally over time as well. So I think I think there's some exciting. You know, ten years is is no, no, I know. Well, sky, it's, it's a big, but 
So 10 years ago, people were talking about drug eluding implants, which yep. I, I think had some cachet, but you know, I, I, now I can't tell you I'm on top of every piece of literature, but it, it seems that it's lost some of its uh, flair. Yeah, look, I, I think there's potential there for, for drugs on the electrode. Uh, but I don't think it's long term sustainable. Yeah, but it's bad. Yeah, it's a long term thing. And so um, there's some opportunity there, but yes, that's still the. There's more to know. Yeah, well, the 25. Everybody, everybody had the right prediction, right? Because I, I know with a lot yeah. of my colleagues, we think all the stuff we do makes a difference. I'm not sure we can demonstrate it measurably makes a difference. We try to make a difference, but measurably is a different story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, I'd hope over that 10 year period, we get better at actually measuring. Correct. Yeah. Uh, how well we're doing, how better ways of actually measuring how people are, their experience, sure. which is part of their hearing, but it's the the quality and content of the sound, it's, it's how well is music being heard. Better able to measure those things um, over time, I think that would be nice. Over 25 years, that's a really tough one. I think it's very hard to say. Yeah, yeah no, I, well, hopefully the real answer, the 25-year answer might be penetration, right? That, the, that there's yeah. not, uh, you know, I mean, uh, to me, one of the reasons I do this mm -hmm. is when you start looking at the numbers in the United States, at least, the incidence of people becoming cochlear implant candidates is greater than the incidence of implantation. Meaning, yes, absolutely going marked, backwards. Right. Yep. And so, and so, so if not, not that people mm -hmm. are, I'm not, but if that were HIV or COVID, yep. we would call that an epidemic or a pandemic, right? And, but yes. because of the way that people have contextualized this, people don't really think of it in that terms. Yeah. But, you know, any disease that is, it has a treat, it's highly mm. treatable, but it's being less treated is a is a health a public health problem that hopefully yep. will work. Yeah, and actually the World Health Organization has started to call this out. Uh that that recognizing that hearing loss is one of the most prevalent medical conditions, one of the least treated. Right. And it's a, and it's a rapidly growing problem uh as as societies age. And certainly uh, that Lancet uh, work study group that talked about it being the most modifiable factor to treat and prevent Alzheimer's and dementia was very profound too. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, I talked about the technology over the five and 10 years, but I think we will, we will see an increasing amount of evidence on these links between hearing loss and cognition and healthy aging emerging over, over the next five years that I think, um, and hope will provide people with a much more compelling reason to treat hearing loss as a, a serious and treatable medical condition. Yeah, I, I would say some of my, uh, in my space, uh, I, you know, it's interesting, we do cochlear implants, but I'm not sure we're as good advocates for hearing loss as we should. Kind of interesting. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a good, interesting observation. Uh, and I kind of, we can all do more to advocate. To, uh, but we could be, we should be leading that advice. charge, I mean, but, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, maybe I'll write a book about it. Um, so it all anyway, helps. It all helps. Yeah, yeah, you know everything. I mean, I really, uh, I wrote the book because I wanted people to know about this problem and that it's not well treated. Mm. Uh, so, so you know, one question I love to ask you: you know, we're in the sound business or the sound field. What, mm. What's your favorite sound? Uh, for me, the favorite sound is waves breaking on the beach. Uh, as much as anything, because it, it's association with um, family uh, holidays. Uh, so yeah, just bring bring back memories. That's awesome. Uh, Are you a surfer? A body surfer. Oh, okay. Well, that's I definitely great. enjoy getting in the sea, and I'm yeah, fortunate yeah. to well, live quite I mean, close. Days, so I if you guys are all in lockdown in Australia, the, the beach is probably one of the best outs if you're allowed to go, right? Yeah, no, it's uh, going going body surfing or swimming in the sea counts as exercise, and we are allowed to uh, leave to exercise. That's so, great. That's great. Well, I think this, is, this has been a great conversation. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, today we've got Dig Howard. He's the uh, CEO of Cochlear. Dig, if people want to get a hold of you, where do they get to get a hold of you? I assume on your, your company website or whatever. Yeah. Yes, www.cochlear.com. Uh, all sorts of information there on hearing loss and uh, yeah, our products and uh, our company overall. And Mark's been terrific to, to be able to join you in this conversation. I've enjoyed yeah. it. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you coming on today. Thank you very much. Thanks. Great to see you. Thanks for tuning in to the Listen Up podcast. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get updates on future episodes.